Just an an aside, uh, Be Thou My Vision is my favorite hymn, Uh, so thanks for picking that one. I always like that one. So, oh, okay. A little birdie, huh? That's one of my favorites. And uh, This morning as we look at what it means to tell a story or be a part of a story, I think uh, having the vision of God and letting Him be the one who walks with us and tells our story, uh, I think is a big deal. Uh, This morning we're going to move into our family altar time, a time of prayer. Uh, I'm going to ask Margaret, where are you sitting? There she is. Uh, She's going to come up. She came up uh, just a few minutes ago and has requested prayer. She's got an x-ray this week uh, regarding her lungs. And so uh, I'm just going to lay hands on her and uh, if you guys will extend a hand and we'll pray over her. Uh, You can sit, that'd be fine. And then we... uh, and then we'll move into the rest of the altar time. And uh, I just encourage you to find a posture of prayer. But first, let's pray over Margaret. And I think she's going to call on us to be Okay. Prepared. We can do it. Thank you. Lord, we're just grateful to be in your house. Lord, Margaret's got a, an appointment this week uh, coming up soon. Lord, there's uh, something on her lung that we just don't know about. And Lord, it causes concern, it causes uh, just worry. And so, Lord, we pray that your hand uh, just touch Margaret. Lord, we just pray for the the appointment coming up that as the x-rays are taken, that uh, it'll be clear uh, what this is and what the course of action will be. Uh, But Lord, we're trusting that you will touch her body that you are the great physician, the one who can bring wholeness and restore her lungs once again. So, Lord, we're just trusting you. Give Margaret peace and comfort as she moves towards this appointment. Lord, we know that uh, it's concerning, it's worrying, uh, but, Lord, may she settle and rest in you. Lord, this morning we pray for Audrey. as uh, She's got an appointment that she's nervous about, worried about, and all the things that come with that. And so, Lord, as she journeys towards it, may may your spirit just draw near, draw her close. And as she exhales, may she find a peace and a comfort in your arms. And, Lord, we just pray that the appointment goes smoothly, that all will be well. Lord, draw near to her. Lord, this morning we are gathered in your house to worship you, to spend time together as a body of believers, as a community, as a family. And so, Lord, I I thank you for each one of these individuals that have found themselves here this morning. Lord, we all come from different places. We all come from different backgrounds, but you have brought us together. And so, Lord, as we worship you, may you hear the cry of our hearts that you are good and that we find joy in you. Because, Lord, as we walk out of this place, we can look around and see chaos and we can see uh, pain and suffering Unfortunately, Lord, that's the reality of our world at this time. But Lord, as we heard this week, that when we believe in you, when we have hope in you, our perspective on pain and suffering and death changes. So Lord, may we walk out not defeated, but may we walk out with our heads held high, knowing that there is hope in you, despite the pain and suffering and chaos. So Lord, let us be bold in your spirit. Let us be infilled this morning, prepared and ready to go and be the people of the church. Be the ecclesia that you've called us to be, the called out ones. Lord, and if there's anyone that needs uh, a special comfort or just your presence, draw near this morning. May they sense you. May it be tangible. May it be something that 
uh, they haven't ever experienced before. And Lord, may we continue to seek you for your guidance, your direction, that you will be our vision for now and in the future. Lord, we're so grateful for all that you're doing now. And as we walk forward, all that you are going to do. Lord, we love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. Thank you, Melva. Appreciate you playing. I'm excited. Do you guys ever get excited? Do you guys ever remind your face to show that you're excited? That's why we wear masks. My, my wife has to remind me to be excited because she'll be super excited and giddy about something and her eyes light up and there's a big smile on her face and then she'll look at me and she goes, why are you not excited? I'm like, I am. She's like, well, tell your face. <laughs> Does that ever happen? Quite frequently, unfortunately. So, Did I wander her off with my Bible? I sure did. I think when my mic broke, I... so if you find a Bible sitting out there somewhere, uh, it's, it's around. This morning, we are going to be in Matthew 28. I don't need it. I've got this one. Uh, Matthew 28. And so if you want to find your way there, this will be a familiar passage. Uh, one that you go, oh, this one again. But I want to ask you. If you were to, and I asked you about this last week about prayer, but if you were to look at your life and you say, man, evangelism is my favorite, would that be a reality for you? How many of you, evangelism is a strength? That's something that you're like, man, I'm good at it. I don't mind it. It's my favorite thing. Thank you. One, I like it. But church, that's not great. One, because guess what? I, I don't even want to raise my hand. And I'm called and ordained to do this. Evangelism's tough. It's hard. And so when we, we look at passages like this, whenever we, we read this, it's, it's sometimes we need a reminder or a kick in the pants. And so this morning, let's hear from Matthew 28. I'm going to read 16 all the way to 20. It says this, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So this morning... This morning, we are going to talk about our story, particularly your singular. What's your story? What's the thing uh, that has driven you? What, what stories can you share? Because our story is God's story. We, we can read this idea of go and make disciples. We've heard this uh, passage quite frequently uh, but this isn't something new. Jesus isn't just pulling this out of thin air and making it like this last stamp on the Gospel of Matthew going, oh yeah, I forgot. You guys need to go and do this. No, God's been working to this uh, since creation, since the beginning. You go all the way back to Abraham, and, and how did God describe Abraham and what he was going to do through him? He was going to make his uh, descendants numerous. But not just his descendants, he was going to then bless all people through Abraham and, and that we were going to experience the goodness of God, even the Gentiles, even the ones who uh, at the beginning didn't seem to be the ones who were worthy of it. We all were going to get to be a part of God's story. And so we have to be willing to share our story. And so as you walked in, there was a few pictures uh, hanging on a string. And then it said, what's your, what's your story? And there was a postcard down on the bottom. Did anyone notice where the postcard was from? Madrid. Who said that? Yeah, Chuck did. Of course he did. <laughs> Attention to detail. <laughs> uh, but the, Madrid. And so I'm going to, over the next six weeks, share parts of my story. 
to help reinforce some of these ideas. And so my story is going to start in Madrid. And I think we have to be willing to share our story. And it's not just go. And this one happens to be about uh, going. I actually went somewhere. But a lot of times you'll see a translation of therefore go, and it's therefore as you go. We're living life. You are going to go somewhere. It doesn't mean you have to, to be the one that goes to the other corner of the earth. But my story, particularly my ministry story, starts here. It starts as I, a 20-year-old, going to Madrid. And I had the, the opportunity. Uh, I was running from a call to ministry. I was called into missions specifically uh, when I was in high school, late in high school, and I said, yeah, no, I'm good. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a part of that. And so for two years, I, I, went, I went on my own, and I said, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a doctor. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to make things work. I did not make things work. Things did not go well. I was dissatisfied. I was disquieted. I was not where I needed to be. And a friend of mine uh, at OSU uh, was a Nazarene, and she had been a part of the church for a long time, and she told me about uh, Youth and Mission. And it was a program for college-age students uh, to go and be a part of mission work over the summer. And so for, uh, from June... To July of 2007, I went to Madrid. Do we have the PowerPoint? Can we throw it up there? I'm going to put some pictures up here. They're, they're going to be kind of small. Um, I'll zoom in on a few of them. I have hard copies of this particular uh, book. My grandmother, go ahead and go to the next slide. My grandmother uh, made me a scrapbook when I got back uh, from Madrid. And it was, it's probably the best Christmas present I've ever received. Uh, it's one that I will cherish. And so the pictures are going to be kind of small, uh, but I'll zoom in on a few of them to highlight them. Uh, but you can go, the book's out there, uh, feel free to peruse it. Uh, but I felt led, so my friend Bethany shared that, hey, I'm going on this, you might look into doing it. Well, I ended up going to Madrid, Spain, but before I got to that point, uh, I was actually supposed to go to England. Uh, we were going to work with some missionaries there. And then the next thing I know, uh, that fell through, and so Youth and Mission was putting us with a group in Germany. We were going to go to Germany. It's like, okay, cool. And then that fell through, and finally we're sitting here going, okay, uh, where are we going to go? They're like, we'll find a spot for you. Just be patient. We'll, we'll get you there. And finally, uh, we settled on Madrid. There had been new missionaries, uh, this apartment building. I was theirs. They, they had just arrived. They'd been in language school for all of four months when we showed up. Uh, they were still new to the country, and they threw a, a team of college-age kids at them. And so um, if you'll go to the next slide, my, my bedroom uh, was in the district superintendent's apartment. Uh, it was more like a sunroom uh, that they found an Ikea bed and threw me out there, and I had the, the little back porch uh, balcony right there. Uh, but they were great people to host. And so my 20-year-old Oklahoma perspective was broadening. I'm now all of a sudden in a place that I'd never been, didn't really know a whole lot about, uh, and I was excited. God was going to do something big. He was going to do something awesome. And so I didn't know what to expect, um, but I had a team of people with me. And so if we'll go to the next one, we, we met my teammates Five days before we left to go out of the country, I'd never met them before, didn't know anything about them. Uh, and so the two girls, Tracy and Ashley, uh, were uh, from the States. And Victor, we didn't meet until we arrived in Spain. He was actually Brazilian, uh, but had moved to Spain when he was seven uh, and was attending European Nazarene College at the time. And he had had one year of English training. And so he spoke English fairly well for a year. And then he spoke Portuguese and Spanish as well. So he served as our interpreter for the, for the year. So we'll zoom in and we can see a little closer. Um, Ashley would not be happy if I showed her this picture with her eyes closed. Um, but a lot of the pictures, Ashley's eyes ended up being closed. I think she forgot how to count. One, two, three. Okay. So she's... Uh, and Ashley and I have actually stayed in touch uh, throughout... Uh, the last few years, and 
Uh, she's been a very much an encouragement to me uh, in ministry. So this is the team. We were set out, and our primary task was going to be VBS. Lots of VBSs. So if you go to the next one, we're going to look at our primary task, task was to do VBS all throughout the country of Spain. Now, Spain, you think, ah, pretty good big country, you know, first world, lots of, you know, accommodations. There was seven churches in Nazarene churches in Spain, all of Spain, and only three of those actually had a building. The other were four were organized, but they were in people's homes. And so you think about the Nazarene church, and uh, we've got quite a few here in BC. Uh, we've got quite a few churches, we've got quite a few organized, but it was a different experience because I came from the Bethany, Oklahoma area, which if you don't know, is home to Southern Nazarene University. And in probably a 20 square mile, we have, I don't know, 60 Nazarene churches. And it, I'm used to Nazarene churches being everywhere. And so to go to Spain and experience this, it was different. And so we were tasked with doing VBS. Well, I'm not too far removed from youth group, from children's church. I'm only 20 years old. And they said, hey, here's, here's your responsibility. And so our first place we went was Yeskis. And this was our only church that was predominantly Spanish. The rest of our churches that we went to were um, immigrants. There were people from Central and South America who had immigrated uh, because during Franco's reign, they had opened up the, po uh, the borders because the Spanish population was dwindling. And so they needed to repopulate the country uh, because Spanish uh, people were not having children. They didn't want children. And so they said, well, our population's declining. That's not a good thing. And so the vast majority of the Nazarene churches that we interacted with were immigrants from Central and South America. Uh, this was a, a fun one. If you go to the next one, uh, we primarily, you know, we'd go to a place. We'd ha have a three to five day VBS, and we would just be meeting these kids for the first time. And so we had to spend some time in introductions. And then Victor was the primary teaching the Bible lessons because, well, he spoke Spanish. You want to feel inadequate, uh, go to a place and not speak the language and be asked to teach. <laughs> yeah, you feel inadequate. So what did I do? I, I made up for it with uh, goofiness and gregariousness. I made sure I was over the top in the games and we had lots of fun. And I did learn the songs. I don't sing. You probably will never hear me lead worship up here. Uh, it's not my thing. Uh, but we sang a song called Sigame, which means follow me. Uh, and, and I would sing over and over nice and loud. And the kids were kind. They didn't laugh too loud. <laughs> but we did this. We did this over and over. So I think over the course, we did six different VBSs over the course that we were there. And if we'll go to the next one, a lot of it was fun and games. I mentioned that I was uh, a part of the games because most of the time you can demonstrate without language or very limited Spanish. And so when I saw this picture in the middle, uh, you probably can't quite tell what it is, but the one's hanging up on the string out there, uh, it's, it's a rubber chicken. And I just saw the picture and it's actually listed below it, but before that even happened, it popped into my head and, it, and I said, pollo de goma. And I don't know why I remember how to say rubber chicken in Spanish, but I know how to say rubber chicken in Spanish after 14 years or 15 years ago. I don't know why, but that rubber chicken was the most popular uh, thing we had. Uh, shortly after this photo, his feet got ripped off. Um, <laughs> he no longer squeaked like a rubber chicken. Uh, that picture on the bottom left, um, we, we had different types of sleeping accommodations. And I actually had a bed in this one, which I appreciated, but I was in literally a closet, like it was just a hideaway. And come to find out, it had bugs. Uh, and so it was all fun and games till the bed bugs bite, and uh, that one was a nice experience. You can go to the next one. It's a little closer. You can't see the bug bites too bad, but it was definitely uh, one that I have not experienced uh, since, and I would rather not uh, have bed bugs again. Uh, but then the, the last, one of the things that we had was, if you'll go to the next one, the lasting uh, impacts. And for me, uh, Ophelita was this gracious host at uh, Ventus, one of the places we went. And uh, her and her husband were the pastors there. And they just opened their house. And they had kids running everywhere. And I mean, they, it was amazing. We did, we did praise and worship in their living room. 
And, I, and we're talking a living room uh, maybe the size of, I don't know, 12 by 12. Not big. Like, it's not a big room. And we cram 15 children in there, and they're all singing and dancing. And you look over, and she's got all her knickknacks on the wall, and, and the, they're shaking and vibrating. And I'm like, oh, those are going to fall and break, and then we're going to be in trouble. Uh, but no, she didn't care because she saw kids worshiping and having fun and experiencing the goodness of God. And, and so she, before we left, uh, wrote a postcard, a little note of thanks and gratitude and encouragement to me. And it's amazing because uh, I don't think she knew. I never had the opportunity to really express the impact that she had on me. You know, I can still see her face. I can still see the graciousness that she shared with me as she uh, hosted us, she fed us, she housed us. You know, just what example she was for me. This 20-year-old kid looking to figure out, okay, Lord, what in the world are you asking me to do? What do you want me to do? You've, you've called me here. You've brought me here. But I know this isn't the end. I know this is probably a beginning. So what does this look like, Lord? And I, I loved every moment. You can go one more. It's a little closer picture of uh, Ophelita. But this woman, the impact that she had on me, and it's so many others while I was in Madrid, was huge. Because it gave me the encouragement to come home and finally rest and go, all right, Lord, what do you want to do through me? What do you need from me? What do you want from me? Because for so long I'd been running from it, I'd said, nah, I'm good. I don't want to be a part of that. And so coming home, I, I found uh, an inn at a church and started volunteering in a Hispanic ministry and just slowly started working into, all right, Lord, I'm open, I'm available. And my story started to shape. My story started to become my own. And so whenever I ask you, what's your story? It's not always going to be some grand expedition where you've gone and you've done. But the story of the here and now is just as important as well. Because remember, out of Matthew, it's, I really like that translation, as you go. As you go. So that means you've got places to go, right? You're going to go and be somewhere. And you're going to share and tell a story. So make sure that the story you're telling is one worth telling. And our stories should be connected to God. Because every aspect of our lives should be connected to God. I, a lot of times we go, well, I don't have a testimony because I don't have any God stories. Well, that's not true. Every aspect of our lives is inundated and permeated with God. And a lot of times we start talking about uh, if we go to testimony time. Everybody remember those? <laughs> but a lot of times testimony time turned into, well, 12 years ago, this happened. And it's like, well... What, what's happened in the 12 years since then? What, what has God, where have you seen God working in the last week? Where have you seen God working in the last month? Where did you see God working yesterday as you went? Because I think sometimes we forget that uh, God's still writing a story in our life. And we get to go and share that. And so, how many of you guys feel like you're good at telling stories? Or, okay, a couple of you, anybody else? Good at telling stories. Because this is one of the most effective ways to evangelize. I will tell you this, going to the street corner and bashing people with a bat and things like that is usually not super effective, except to get you arrested for assault and battery. But the story that you tell with your life, the one that you share each and every day with individuals as you live life with them, is one of the most effective tools for discipleship. Now, you guys, no matter your age, are being discipled. Do you guys agree with that? Are you past discipleship? No. You are still being discipled. We are all still being discipled. Now, we have to be careful on who we're letting disciple us. There's a lot of options out there now. But guess what? Because you are being discipled, that means you get the responsibility to go and disciple somebody else. Because remember, as we go, we're not just going. We have a responsibility to disciple, to baptize. 
And then we also have the responsibility to remember that Christ is always with us. And he's the one empowering us. And, and a couple of our congregation have written stories down. They've told their story. You guys know who that is? Well, they just happen to be sitting on the same row. Rita and Merle. They've both told stories. They put it in, they put it in writing, put a cover on it, and put it out into the world. That's pretty brave. Are you, have you shared your story lately? Have you told a story to anyone lately? Particularly the story of how God's worked in your life. I know I just did what I said I wasn't going to do. I went back 15 years. But uh, the stories you guys are going to hear over the next six weeks are our stops in ministry. And important passages in our life. And how it's shaped who I am, who Alicia and I are as a couple, and who we are as a family. And so I'm asking you, who, what is your story? What things do you have to share? How has God used you? How is God continuing to use you? And so I need your help. Do you guys have any hard copies of pictures anymore? Do you guys still print those? Because most of them are on my phone, and I don't get a whole lot of hard copies of pictures. But I need you to, I need you to go, and I need you to find some pictures. Oh, this is Ophelita's uh, living room. But I need you to go and find some hard copies of pictures. Just a couple that tell a story. That that picture is associated with a story. And whenever one of us goes and looks at it, and we go, hey, tell me about this. You can go and say, well, here's the story. Because we need to be able to share our story. And if we can't share our story with one another as a family of God, uh, what hope do we have to be able to share our story with those out in the world who are searching for hope? And so do you guys guys have stories? Do you believe you have a story? You do. I want to encourage you and tell you you do. But I need you to go back this week and find a couple pictures. Don't Don't bring the whole thing. Just a couple. We don't have space for everybody to bring their whole shoebox full. But bring a couple of pictures. And I want to know your story. And I know others want to know your story. And I know at a certain point, a lot of times, uh, you get to a certain age and some of your stories become more uh, fantastic. (laughs) More unbelievable. (laughs) Because some of the details change. And they become slightly... uh, altered, but they're still true, mostly. And so I want you to come prepared to share those. Uh, we had a, a man in our church in Lawton named Max, World War II vet, uh, lived an interesting life. Uh, this man had stories um, for days. There was about the same six or seven stories that I would hear uh, repeatedly. And my favorite thing was I could literally write the story down before he said it, but then I could also pick out the three or four different versions of the same story. And it, and it was just, it was fun. Uh, I loved hearing who he was, and, he, and what he always did that I really appreciated was he brought it back to how God had worked in his life. Whether the story was from, uh, he was a young man, actually was raised in Washington. Uh, his dad was a, a crop share on an apple farm. And it raised in Washington, or uh, even to the work that God did uh, to being baptized uh, at 80-something years old. It was just great to hear his stories. And so I want to encourage you to find your stories. Be ready to share them because, as Jesus says, we have a responsibility. We have a job to do. So as you go, think about where you're headed this week. Are you going to work? Are you retired and going to hang out at home? Go to a social group with a four-year-old? Maybe go on holiday? (laughs) Joyce is missing that. (laughs) But maybe you've got, what is your as you go this week? I want you to start thinking about it and find moments and opportunities to share your story. Share the story of what God's done. Because the best form of discipleship we can do is to gather 
to be in a relationship and to share stories. And so I'm hoping as soon as we can get past some of these uh, uptick in COVID numbers and things like that, because the, the actual plan for this was to, to end this with a, a nice uh, meal where we exchange stories, and because there's nothing better than breaking bread and uh, eating around a table to share stories. And so we'll just keep praying that we'll get there. Uh, we're going to do all we can to, to make sure that's the case. Uh, but find a way to share your story this week. See where God prompts you. Be obedient in it and share the stories that shape you. I could talk to you about Spain if you go look at any of the pictures and you want to know uh, what's, this, what's this story behind this photo. Uh, I'd be more than happy to share. I almost, uh, and Alicia was disappointed I didn't. At the time in 2007, man prees were a thing. Do you guys know what man prees were? Yeah, I didn't think so. Uh, probably best that I didn't do it. Uh, so it was capris uh, that men wore uh, all over uh, Western Europe. And I was in Western Europe, and I thought, you know what? I'm a young man. I'm going to wear capris. And so I had lots of pants that went right about there, nice and fitted. And so I have a pair that are a little short, and I could roll up and make it look like it. Uh, so maybe one of these days I'll wear some man capris again. Uh, <laughs> uh, but just subtle things. Um, the impact that... Uh, each of those members on our team, uh, how vivid I remember what, what God did through us with uh, kids some 15 years ago. And so these stories, as you look through your pictures and you remember, be ready to share. But don't wait till next Sunday. Find somebody this week as you go to share a story with. Let me pray for us. Lord, You've given us a heart, a heart that desires relationship, because God, you are a relational God. You, you created us with the intention of finding perfect and whole relationship. Lord, we as human beings often make choices that, that hurt that. But Lord, you are a gracious God, and as, as Jesus told his disciples at the end of Matthew, that you are still here despite the things that we've done, that you're going with us no matter where we are. So Lord, as we go this week, I pray that each one of us, each one of us will be sensitive to your leading, that as you bring people across our path, that, that you say, hey, speak into their life reaching to the ends of the earth, but Lord, we got to start somewhere. Here's as good as any. So Lord, bring those people across our path. Let us be faithful in telling of your goodness and how you've written our story and how you've made an impact on our lives. And Lord, as we disciple through story and relationship, may our stories join together. Because, Lord, we are taught to remember all that you've commanded. And all that you've commanded of us is to love you and love others. And so, Lord, may our stories be of caring for one another. Of lifting one another up to you. But, Lord, as we journey through these next six weeks, may you continually uh, just place on our hearts the work that you do. Not just the ones from 15, 20 50 years ago, but Lord, the things that you're doing now, the things that you uh, want us to be, see, may we not miss those moments. And Lord, may we share them, may we speak them, and give them a voice. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for uh, empowering us. Lord, thank you for giving us a story that so much of it is still unwritten. Lord, may we be sensitive to your leading and see what we have in store. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.